Next on Current News, visiting the community with the lowest vaccination rate in the whole city. As more people in New York City receive their COVID-19 vaccines, one neighborhood is falling behind the others. I'm Emily Druby with what's being done to help it catch up. Plus, church leaders are speaking out after another act of vandalism against the Diocese of Brooklyn. When you deface the house of God, it has a, another level of seriousness. Pope Francis rejects the resignation of the top cardinal from Germany, the pontiff calling on him to tend to his sheep. <laughs> and the Diocese of Brooklyn is taking on climate change, launching a new energy initiative at an affordable housing residence. The news starts right now. Good evening, I'm Christine Persichetti. The neighborhood with one of the highest COVID-19 death rates in the city is also the lowest vaccinated. Far Rockaway in Queens has just a quarter of its residents fully protected against coronavirus. Current News Emily Druby went there to find out why and what's being done about it. Far Rockaway, Queens, a community devastated by COVID. But with one of the city's highest death rates, they also have one of its lowest vaccination rates. Only 26% of people fully vaccinated and 32% with their first dose. Father David Bertolotti serves at a local parish. While he made the decision to get vaccinated, he's heard many reasons for hesitancy from parishioners. Some people, it's political. They don't want to be uh, forced. Some uh, people uh, feel for, for their own health, they're afraid. Reasons Dr. Ari Benjamin has heard too. You get the full range, um, but I think the majority of people are reasonable and they just, you know, a little hesitant because they're, it is something new. He's with the Joseph Piadabo Family Health Center as one of the few health care providers in the area. They've been at the forefront of the neighborhood's vaccination effort. Their CEO, Miriam Vega, says the low rate comes from the two A's, the first being accessibility. The Far Rockaway area is a very isolated, insular uh, community. They don't want to get on the A train to try to get to uh, some other location deep in Queens. According to the city, there's now seven sites and two pop-ups in Far Rockaway and neighboring Edgemere to address this concern. The second issue is acceptability. The Adabo Center has been using education to change that. Talking to patients, bringing teams into the streets and holding town halls, urging people to ask questions. Come in and speak with someone and get an informed opinion. Um, that's the most important part. Don't listen to what you see on the internet or from someone who may not you know, be an expert. It's a very diverse area. The health center changing their messaging based on the community they're talking to. The education push seems to be working. The health center, which is now only vaccinating people on the weekends, had over 500 people this last weekend, a 40% jump from previous weeks. Once a couple of people get the vaccine, the neighbors are like, oh, they got it too, and they're okay, so maybe I should get it as well. In Far Rockaway, Emily Druby, Currents News. The next three neighborhoods with the lowest vaccination numbers are also within the Diocese of Brooklyn. According to the City Health Department, in part of Flatlands, Midwood, and Canarsie, only 34% of residents have received at least one shot. 35% of the community in Bedford-Stuyvesant have received one dose of the vaccine. Police are investigating after a Queens church was vandalized, the most recent in a growing trend of crimes on Diocese of Brooklyn buildings. Immaculate Conception Parish in Astoria was tagged in multiple spots on Tuesday afternoon. The church's pastor, Monsignor Fernando Ferrarisi, says this is the first time the church has been vandalized in the 14 years he served there. While he doesn't believe the act was intended to be a hate crime, it has struck a chord with his parishioners. They saw it and they're all outraged that the house of God should be um, uh, so targeted by someone so uh, crass and so malicious to, um, to do something like that. The parish's Knights of Columbus Council has reached out to the pastor about paying for the graffiti's removal.
Other churches and buildings in the diocese have had to clean up or make repairs after vandals hit. Last month, the head of baby Jesus was knocked off a statue depicting the Virgin Mary holding the infant in front of the offices of the diocese. Police are also investigating after a statue of Mary was pushed over and broken into pieces at St. Adelbert's in Elmhurst. The Hate Crimes Task Force is looking into both cases. If you have any information on who may have damaged the statues or spray painted the church buildings, call Crime Stoppers at 800 -5 577 tips that's 800-577-8477 and later on in this newscast bishop nicholas demarzio is speaking out against the recent vandalism he sits down with former tablet editor ed wilkinson to talk about what needs to be done to stop the hate that's still ahead Turning now to the Vatican, Pope Francis has rejected the resignation of German Cardinal Reinhard Marx. The Holy Father publishing his full response in both Spanish and German on the Vatican website. In it, the pontiff tells Cardinal Marx that the church cannot adopt an ostrich policy in the handling of the abuse crisis, saying, we have to take ownership of our history, both personally and as a community. Cardinal Marx sent his letter late last week offering his resignation, not for an accusation of abuse, but to highlight the importance of sharing the, quote, responsibility for the catastrophe of sexual abuse by church officials. Cardinal Marx is the head of the Archdiocese of Munich Friesing and a member of the Council of Cardinals, Pope Francis's personal advisors on church matters. Ahead of the Pope's response, Currents News spoke with the editor at Crocs, John Allen, about Cardinal Marx's resignation and the impact this could have on the church. What I do know uh, is that every time you have a religious order or a country or a diocese where a clerical abuse scandal erupts, the question is going to be, why can't you follow Cardinal Marx's example? John also believed at the time that this wouldn't be an end to Cardinal Marx's career in the church, but maybe the beginning of a new and potentially more important chapter of his story. U.S. bishops are speaking out against the Supreme Court's ruling on people with temporary protected status. The high court ruled on Monday that immigrants on TPS who entered the country illegally cannot apply for green cards or become permanent residents. Those with TPS are still protected from deportation and can work legally. But following the Supreme Court's decision, U.S. bishops are now calling on Congress to fix the immigration system, saying if somebody is in this country seeking protection and if they stay here five years, 10 years, 15 years or 20 years, like some of the Hondurans and El Salvadorians, home is here and there's no home to go back to. President Joe Biden's first foreign trip kicks off with a meeting with UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Biden faces an uphill battle to reassert American leadership with key allies. Isabel Rosales looks into the key conversations with world leaders ahead of a high stakes meeting with the Russian president. President Joe Biden's debut on the world stage. Hello. For the first time, he meets face to face with UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson. I told the Prime Minister we have something in common. We both married way above our station. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to descend from that one. But I'm not going to disagree with the president that, or indeed on anything else. Uh, I think. It Biden and Johnson signing an updated Atlantic Charter, the pivotal document FDR signed with Prime Minister Winston Churchill to define Allied goals for the post-war world. Both leaders lifting U.S.-U.K. COVID-19 travel restrictions. Plus. A major announcement. This is about our responsibility. Biden vowing to buy 500 million Pfizer vaccine doses to donate to the world. The largest single purchase and donation of COVID-19 vaccines by any single country ever. A busy schedule ahead for President Biden, including a G7 summit. The message? America is back. I'm heading to the G7, then to the NATO ministerial, and then to meet with Mr. Putin to let him know what I want him to know. It all leads to that showdown next week with Russian President Vladimir Putin. These tough talks expected to cover Russia's aggression with Ukraine, interference with U.S. elections, and a recent string of cyber attacks originating in Russia that shut down a major U.S. gas pipeline and the world's largest beef supplier. In Washington, Isabel Rosales, Currents News. 
Meat supplier JBS has paid $11 million following that ransomware attack. The company says the infiltration shut down its beef processing operations last week. It says most facilities had come back online by the time it paid, but it decided to do so to ensure customers faced no risk. JBS says it doesn't think any private data got out during the attack. The price of meat in the U.S. has gone up since the attack and does not seem to be coming down. There's a lot more news headed your way. Bishop DiMarzio doing his part to save the environment, taking a page out of the Pope's book. Sustainability and faith go hand in hand here on a Brooklyn rooftop. I'm Jessica Easthope with how Catholic Charities was inspired by a papal encyclical. The bishop is also talking about why he thinks churches have been the target of vandals. And Catholic schools in the Diocese of Brooklyn are ahead of the curve. Lawmakers around the country are pushing for classes some of our students already take. There are now some big changes to the tablet website. You can get personalized access to the Catholic news you value. Sign up for free at thetablet.org. Brooklyn Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio joining with Catholic Charities Brooklyn and Queens to do their part to save the environment. The bishop helped to cut the ribbon at the Laudato Sea Corporation, a new renewable energy initiative focused on climate change named after the Pope's 2015 writing. Jessica Easthope was at that ribbon cutting and has more. <laughs> Top in Brooklyn, faith and sustainability are meeting. These solar panels are a pilot for the Laudato Si Corporation, Catholic Charities Brooklyn and Queens' latest initiative inspired by Pope Francis's 2015 encyclical. Our relationship with the earth, you know, should be comparable to our relationship with God. We should be good stewards and we should protect, you know, what the earth naturally provides us. This summer, Catholic Charities is putting solar panels on the roofs of four of its affordable housing buildings, making low-income families part of the climate change solution. It's an issue for the whole world of everybody's uh, benefit, of, of, of especially the poor people, who seem to get the brunt of every ecological disaster. It is the people who are the poorest really suffer the most. Not only are these solar panels ecological, they're economical. The panels pump more than 250 kilowatts of power back into the grid that Con Edison pays for. We will be using the revenue generated through this to reinvest in those other buildings. You know, where traditionally uh, you would have to go get a loan and there's costs associated with that. This is to set up a little bit of financial flexibility. Catholic Charities is hoping sustainability in the Diocese of Brooklyn will reach new heights and create waves of change. Creation has been entrusted to humanity, and so we're called to, it's not just given, it's entrusted, so we're supposed to care for it, and that's really what Pope Francis calls it, to care for, and by making these buildings a little more um, energy efficient, sustainable, we're, we're helping the environment. Solar panels are expected to be installed on four of Catholic Charities' 44 buildings used for supportive housing, seniors, and low-income families by early fall. In Prospect Heights, Jessica Easthope, Currents News. Returning now to one of our top stories, the recent wave of attacks on churches in the Diocese of Brooklyn. Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio is sitting down with former tablet editor Ed Wilkinson to discuss the problem and possible solutions in this week's Into the Deep. Ed. Thank you, and today we're going to talk with Bishop DiMarzio about some high-profile acts of vandalism against the church that have taken place recently. Uh, Bishop, we see some statues being beheaded and crosses being toppled over, and, and I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. Is this just mischief, or is this like a hatred for our faith? Well, I think it's a mixture of both. We see that, unfortunately, the people who perpetrate these crimes usually have some mental issues. It's spurred on by different things that happen. Uh, we see uh, some of it could be uh, as a reaction to the current situation in the Holy Land uh, between the Arabs and the Jews there. But uh, again, uh, there are others, you know, some people that they think we're idol worshipers when they see our statues outside. So it, it's. There's no easy answer or no one answer to say why these things happen. It's unfortunate that they do. And people, we as that have rights to put decorations, if anybody puts other decorations out, well, these 
are more than decorations to us, but we have the same right as everybody else to decorate our homes and churches and, and uh, yards with uh, symbols that are religious. And uh, it's hope, unfortunate that people don't respect this. Yeah. Uh, one of the incidents involved a statue outside the Dasson office building where your office is. What are we doing about that? Are we going to rebuild that statue, put it back together? Well, we're having it was a beautiful carved marble statue, which we installed about two years ago. And unfortunately, someone uh, pulled the head off the, the baby Jesus that Our Lady was holding. Mm -hmm. So we, I think we can uh, uh, get that repaired. We're working on that. Yeah. There also have been a lot of incidents of people being attacked because uh, because of the way they look, where like Orthodox Jews or Asian Americans seem to be being attacked in the street for no reason except for anti-discrimination. What, what could we say, what could we do to help uh, alleviate these situations? Well, I think we've got to be clear that we can't have prejudices that uh, turn into uh, violence. Um, you know, everybody has their own ideas of things and blame people for others. We always look for somebody to blame for some, some issue. Uh, let's find who, who's the blame. Can we, we don't want to take any responsibility ourselves sometimes. So we're looking for people to blame and the blame winds up hurting uh, people uh, as victims themselves. Yeah. Poor victims. It, seems so all, it seems to be all part of a larger picture of an increasing crime or at least we're becoming more aware of some of these crimes. Well, uh, it, it, the crime in our city is on the uptick. Unfortunately, there's too many guns. We see too many, too many people being uh, hurt with guns. We need to do something about stopping the uh, inflow of guns into our city. Too many people have guns. Too many young people have guns, and they use them. Yeah, and you mentioned the mentally ill. Is I mean, there must be a better way of treating the mentally ill than just releasing them, allowing them to roam the streets the way they do. I, you know, I am a social worker. When I was in Newark, I ran the agency. We had a program where we had social workers who went out every day to give medication to those who were mentally ill. Many mentally ill people, they don't take the medication for whatever reason. But this program was a state program, which we got a contract to do. And they had a fleet of cars, and they made their rounds. They knew they had to find these people at a particular time, a particular place. If they didn't, there would be reporting, and it worked very well. Mm -hmm. These mentally ill people lived on their own. They had a lot of freedom, but they were, in a certain sense, helped to take their medication, mm -hmm. which kept them uh, calm, which let them uh, deal with their mental illness in a way that was not violent to anyone else. Those kind of programs we need here in New York. Mm -hmm. You think that uh, that could be done here in New York, like you did in uh, Newark? It was done. It was done. It was done in Newark. It could be done in New York. Mm -hmm. Bishop, thanks so much for being with us today. Okay. And now back to the news desk. Thanks, Ed and Bishop DiMarzio. Schools across the country could be adopting a Queens Catholic School solution to the problem of anti-Asian hate. A bill that would require public schools to teach Asian American studies has just cleared the Illinois Senate, and if signed by the state's governor, they would be the first to do so. Similar mandates are being proposed by lawmakers in New York, Connecticut, and Wisconsin. That's already happening in the Diocese of Brooklyn. Students at St. Michael's Catholic Academy in Flushing are learning about Asian history and culture as well as having some classes in Mandarin. The school is 70% Asian, and the staff says the hallowed halls have become a safe haven and a place of acceptance for students. Still to come on Currents News, we're showing some love for the doctors at the Vatican's Children's Hospital who pulled off a heart transplant from an unlikely donor. And we'll speak with a man who has spent decades researching so he can call his great uncle a saint. Do you have a story idea or want to share a tip? Email us at newstips at desalesmedia.org or call our 24-hour number 718-517-3122. We'll be right back.
For the first time ever, a children's hospital at the Vatican was able to transplant an organ from a COVID positive donor to a negative patient. The recipient, a 15 year old boy, suffered from a condition that affected his heart's ability to pump blood to the rest of his body. The teenager had been on the waiting list for a new heart since last year and was able to undergo the life saving procedure despite difficulties from the pandemic. Tomorrow marks the 106th anniversary of Father Leonard Melki's death. He was a Capuchin friar martyred in Turkey during the Armenian genocide simply for being a Christian. Stabbed with a dagger in the heart on the feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Now he's on his way to becoming a saint. The man behind the push for sainthood, his great nephew Ferez Melki, joins us now. And Ferez, first tell us why do you want your great uncle to become a saint? Because uh, I believe he deserves it. He was a holy man who never ignored his religious mission and his duty towards his colleagues. Even when his faith was tested, when they offered to spare his life, and if he converted to Islam, he remained loyal. I also believe he would make a great example for the youth of today, as he was assassinated as a young man at the age of 34. He showed that despite his use, he was able to display wisdom and faith. Mm -hmm. Now, tomorrow is the anniversary of Father Leonard's assassination. Can you tell us a little bit more about his life and why you believe he was assassinated? He was born in Baghdad, Lebanon in 1881. His name was Joseph. He joined the Capuchin order when he was 14 where his superiors gave him the name of Leonard, as Saint Leonardo da Porto Maurizio. He was arrested in his convent in Mardin and thrown into prison, where he had to undergo all kinds of torture for eight days to try and get him to confess to a fabricated plot against the Ottoman government. Mm. When this failed, they chose to kill him. Oh, it's so sad. How, how long has the cause for sainthood process taken you so far? And, and what's it been like? My research is done in cooperation with the Capuchin Order, and it took around 40 years. And we are waiting for the current pandemic situation to come down so that we can hold an official celebration in Lebanon. We are also hoping that in recognition of this event, Pope Francis will uphold his promise to visit Lebanon and preside over the celebration. For the future, we are praying for a certified miracle, as there will need to be one for the possibility of sainthood. Right. I believe the situation gives hope to the Christian community of Lebanon. And if we are faithful, will establish Lebanon as a land of saints indeed. All right, Faraz Melki, great nephew of Father Leonard Melki, and please keep us posted on your progress. Thank you. And that is Current News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.